Welcome to the 19th lecture of the course Surface Engineering. Uh, you heard already in the last lecture that we uh, have decided to devote uh, two lectures specifically on various strengthening mechanisms possible. Though these mechanisms are primarily meant for the bulk strengthening, but uh, nevertheless they are equally applicable to the surface. But you do not necessarily do it only for the surface, but what is important is we should know how does, how should the interior of the solid, how does the bulk of the solid behave uh, when it is subjected to mechanical deformation or any amount of mechanical stresses and see if that could be changed or improved upon onto the surface. But in many cases the uh, mechanism by which you actually strengthen the surface is not going to be very different than what is applicable to the bulk. So, that is why we are devoting uh, these two uh, lectures only on the strengthening mechanism of, uh, of, the, of the various possibilities of engineering solids. So, in the previous lecture we discussed only metallic materials and uh, uh, um, uh, compared to that we will now discuss uh, two other classes of uh, engineering solids namely the, uh, the ones uh, which are um, uh, so, we will be discussing um, uh, for example, a large extent on the ceramic materials. So, these are uh, the various ceramic strengthening mechanisms applicable to ceramic materials. We will also be uh, describing the strengthening mechanisms applicable to polymers. So, um, so let us I mean, we will go one by one and then obviously, we will have a greater opportunity to discuss. But then uh, this is not exhaustive. I mean, there could be certain strengthening mechanisms possible uh, by some other means, but these are generally the more important and more um, uh, widely used uh, strengthening mechanisms. Okay? So, now, um, for example, uh, think of a glass. Now, this glass could be a metallic glass also, but at the moment we are discussing uh, oxide or silicate or various other kinds of inorganic glasses and which are non-metallic in nature. So, uh, this is typically a, a glassy matrix where uh, you do not expect any plasticity at all. And in, uh, in this kind of a situation, since uh, a glass is a subset of uh, of amorphous uh, solids. Uh, in glass, what you typically expect is that it will have very high strength, but this uh, uh, strength uh, essentially is going to be um, uh, not without any uh, penalty. In other words, uh, if you draw the stress strain curve of this kind of a material compared to a metal which will show a very huge amount of plasticity a glass essentially will give you very high strength, but will break immediately. So, there is no plasticity at all, it is only uh, you can have a very high elastic modulus, but you can bring in certain level of plasticity in glass by way of introducing small crystallites like this. And these small crystallites actually, uh, essentially what it means is that you um, carry out devitrification and as a result of which there could be uh, some amount of uh, crystallites or crystalline regions or pockets of uh, three dimensional periodic arrays of uh, cations and anions they appear into the matrix and these actually have a higher toughness than the rest of the matrix. So, if there is a thermal shock or any amount of uh, uh, suddenly applied mechanical uh, load then these pockets actually can absorb some of these loads and as a result the material can behave uh, in a slightly uh, better than this completely brittle can actually show a slightly uh, higher uh, ductile behavior. So, partial crystallization can make a glass tougher and we will see that how this can be made use of in uh, other examples. We also can create a situation in uh, ceramic materials, I am not necessarily talking of glass. So, if you are dealing with ceramic materials, uh, they can be single and they can be multi-phase 
In a ceramic material, if we can have combinations of a very hard and a soft or a very or relatively smaller volume fraction of softer phases in hardened matrix, then also we can bring in certain amount of toughness. So, we are not so much concerned with ductility, what we want in ceramic materials is the property called toughness, which essentially means that uh, when uh, a certain amount of loading is applied, the bulk actually is able to absorb certain amount of uh, incident energy on it. We did discuss a little bit about uh, texturing in the previous uh, discussion. So, the, uh, the logic is exactly the same that if we can bring in a particular uh, orientation, uh, specific orientation in the crystallites by way of certain thermally activated uh, treatments, then uh, the crystal as a whole, the ceramic as a whole can uh, behave in a slightly more stronger way. We um, also, we deal with in, in case of uh, both polymer matrix or ceramic matrix, we, we certainly would like to uh, introduce strengthening by way of the strategy called formation of composites. And when we talk of composites, essentially we are talking about a matrix phase and we are talking about reinforcement. And when we talk of reinforcement, these reinforcements can be a particle, can be fiber or they may have even different shapes like laminates and so on. So, this uh, reinforcements essentially they provide, uh, th they are the agents of strengthening the matrix and these reinforcements can be discontinuous fibers like this, but aligned they can be non-aligned or disaligned, so randomly aligned or they can actually be fibers with uh, very high directionality and uh, very high aspect ratio. So, you are talking about several hundred micron length, but diameter wise uh, cross section wise may be hardly one or two micrometers or even less. So, in all these such cases, we actually create a situation where shearing of the matrix is impeded by the presence of these kind of reinforcements. Now, um, we um, think of another very widely used class of material called the silicate glasses, typically the window panes, window glasses. So, they are nothing but, uh, uh, they are nothing but uh, glass, uh, which is uh, the origin of which is uh, actually um, silicate. Okay. So, for example, if this is the piece of a glass pane and if there is a projectile which comes and hits the glass pane, uh, our common experience is that it is going to shatter uh, in no time. I mean it cannot take any deformation, it will break into pieces in a very, very brittle manner. In order to strengthen this kind of a glass sheet, so, if this is the glass sheet that we are talking about, which has a very uh, thin section and uh, but is uh, fairly wide in x and y directions. So, we would like to make this sheet uh, tough enough so that any impact in the longitudinal direction or sorry in the transverse direction will not immediately uh, lead to such uh, catastrophic failure. How do we do that? So, first of all, uh, we must realize that when we are talking about glass, we are talking about a glass transition phenomenon, but we are not talking, we are not expecting any sharp first order transition that is common of any crystalline material. That means, there is no fixed melting temperature, only change in viscosity. So, essentially this is how we are plotting, uh, for example, viscosity or specific volume as a function of temperature. And as we cool like this, uh, in case of metals or all uh, pure crystals, we see a sharp change in specific volume across this temperature and we call this melting temperature or melting phenomenon or solidification phenomenon, which occurs across a particular point of temperature because uh, we can easily explain in terms of the Gibbs energy that as we cool through like this. So, we have uh, for example, the two phases and there will be an intersection of the two phases. So, this is uh, a liquid and this is solid 
and uh, at this crossover point, which is a melting temperature, uh, as we cool to lower and lower temperature, as soon as we, uh, so this is liquid, so as soon as we move and uh, reach this particular uh, transition point, then uh, because of the tendency for lowering of Gibbs energy, the particular uh, material will now follow this path instead of this path. So, it will now move from liquid into solid and this happens across a specific uh, transition temperature called the melting temperature. While this is possible in crystalline material, this is not seen in glassy substances because they are amorphous, there is no long range periodicity, they do not enjoy the same atom to atom distance of separation and not exactly the same forces of cohesion throughout. So, what we see instead is a glass transition temperature. So, these glasses actually are supercooled liquid in this region because they behave as solid, as rigid solid simply because the viscosity is very, very low, but they are not necessarily uh, uh, the same, behave the same way as a crystalline solid. So, for example, if you take a glass uh, silicate glass, uh, this is the bulk of the glass in heated condition and now if you use some kind of a, a air stream to cool the surface faster than the bulk because you know conductivity wise uh, uh, silicate glasses have very poor conductivity. So, when you, uh, when you blow air from the surfaces, the surface cools faster but the center still remains at a slightly higher temperature. So, very soon this comes at room temperature, this part comes at room temperature, but the core still remains at slightly higher temperature. So, the core is still at a temperature which is higher than the room temperature and then subsequently the core tries to, uh, to come to room temperature to uh, cool. So, when it tries to cool, already the surface is very rigid because it is already come to room temperature, this is a silicate glass. Now, they try to actually uh, draw this material in because of the possibilities, because of the tendencies of shrinkage. We all know that with decrease in temperature, most of the solids will have uh, a positive uh, coefficient of thermal expansion and because of which as a result of decrease in temperature uh, and the uh, uh, phenomenon called uh, thermal uh, contraction due to decrease in temperature, we will expect the core which was still at a higher temperature now will try to shrink and when it tries to shrink, that shrinkage is opposed by the already hard layer onto the surface and as a result, they will try to pull in materials inside, but the force of uh, reaction will be on the opposite side and as a result, the surface will develop residual compressive stresses. So, this part will be under compression, this part will be under compression, whereas inside, so this is the cross section. So, the surface will be at compressive force, will experience compressive force and uh, will be at, uh, will be seeing the negative forces and uh, the core will actually experience tensile stresses. So, this is inconsequential. What is important is that up to a certain thickness, you are experiencing residual compressive stresses. So, now when a projectile hits the surface of the glass, first it has to overcome this residual compressive stresses and then only the crack can propagate. So, as a result, the glass now acts tougher. So, this is how you can strengthen the, uh, the silicate glasses. Now, uh, we actually can uh, apply a similar strategy not by so called thermal treatment, but by various chemical treatments. So, this is how you can actually cool uh, the glass sheets and make thermal tempering. You can also do chemical uh, toughening of glass by allowing the glass to uh, be exposed to certain chemicals, which will uh, create certain um, uh, chemical reactions onto the surface and then bring in certain ions and because of the reaction, there will be some substitutional reactions. As a result, you will form a certain um, reactive layer or reaction product layer onto the surface, which will have uh, bigger um, ions, bigger cations and hence uh, there could also be the possibility of 
formation of uh, residual compressive stresses. So, this uh, uh, kind of uh, treatment, chemical treatment can also make the glass tougher. So, both thermal tempering as well as chemical tempering or toughening of glass can make it more uh, uh, resistant to uh, failure. Now, um, we saw uh, glimpses of devitrification, but here you can understand it better. Um, that uh, so, if you have uh, so this is a kinetic diagram. So, this is uh, temperature and this is time. So, essentially, this is a kinetic diagram where we are plotting uh, the variation of or progress of certain uh, transformations in this uh, time temperature plot. So, this red line here is the beginning of a transformation the blue line is the end of the transformation. Now, if you are able to cool following this path 1, then you are going to end up having practically the whole of crystal. So, that means, you can devitrify the entire bulk of the glass. If you cool on the other hand relatively fast, then from fairly uh, less viscous uh, liquid glass, you end up forming a glass at room temperature, which will be uh, very rigid, but will remain completely uh, glassy and non-crystalline. But if you adopt a cooling rate, which is somewhat in between, then you actually will start the formation of these crystallites, but you may end in a situation where you will have both glass as well as ceramic or crystals. By ceramic, what we mean is that they are crystals or they have long range periodicity. So, we can actually end up having a situation where if this is the matrix and majority of the matrix region is all glass, then we can also bring in certain crystallites in between. So, these pockets of crystallites will be uh, spread all over. The advantage of having a matrix having a uh, composite like this is that uh, all of us are aware of the microwave cooking wares and we would have seen that those glass uh, uh, utensils they do not break. Whereas, if you uh, place a normal glass uh, glass we use for drinking water, if you just straight away place it inside the microwave oven and try to heat up your milk, it may crack and it does crack suddenly. That is because it is unable to withstand the pressure or the mechanical forces developed due to sudden heating and cooling and the associated uh, contraction expansion and contraction forces associated with such uh, heating and cooling. But instead of such uh, silicate all silicate uh, matrix, if you have this glass ceramic, so if you have this glass ceramic uh, matrix or, or material or, or the particular utensil then the ceramic portions of these uh, of the thickness will take care of the sudden rise in temperature and uh, decrease in temperature and be able to absorb the thermal shock. So, in other words these agencies act as cushioning centers to absorb the uh, uh, high amount of surface uh, high amount of uh, stresses that this uh, bulk can experience or is subjected to. So, in a situation like that we can, uh, so by, so in, in, in that very uh, logic by going by that very logic devitrification not necessarily the whole, but a partial devitrification can actually uh, give rise to formation of glass ceramic and uh, so partially crystallized glass which actually uh, will be much tougher than a, either a complete glass or a completely vitrified, devitrified or a completely crystalline uh, silicate glass. So, um, one other thing that we need to discuss a little bit at this moment is uh, the, the way the polymeric solids behave or how can we strengthen polymeric solids. Uh, Crystallization or partial crystallization is a possible strategy and in fact, uh, there are many, many polymers which actually undergo such uh, kind of partial crystallization and in the process they offer you a higher strength than a normal uh, in a normal condition. Uh, 
but before we actually go into that, let's uh, quickly recapitulate. We did discuss about the structure of polymeric solids and uh, we said that uh, they essentially are made by Mars. So, this uh, uh, little blobs here, they are essentially the um, they are individual Mars. So, we just connect these Mars through a thread and that is what is known as a polymer. Now, repetition of them can be linear. So, we call it a linear polymer. It can be branched it can be networked or it can be cross linked. So, we can have linear polymer, branch polymer, cross linked or networked, but if we the, all these are like pure metal or a pure substance because all the Mars have the same composition, but we, if we mix two or three different types of Mars. So, we create what is known as copolymers and the copolymers can be uh, random can be uh, alternate can be a block or can be graft. So, either we have pure polymers or copolymers and in one of these structural configurations the polymeric solid that we see for example, if this is a polymeric solid all these chains basically are arranged randomly unless the fabrication process demands that they should be aligned. So, if this is a solid, we simply call it solid because it is rigid, it has a particular volume and shape which it does not change unless it is acted upon by forces. So, so this shape that we see of a polymeric ob object is because of the fact that we have millions of such threads inside which are all jumbled up because of the rigidity that they create because they are not able to move or not able to deform very easily. So, we call it a solid, but there is no long range periodicity in it. But if you take out one of these uh, threads like, like one of these long chains and if you make it actually undergo back and forth folding motion. So, just like as if you have a chain Imagine a, a, a chain with multiple links. So, if you have a chain with such multiple links, so these are the links where they are attached. So, when you actually lower this chain onto a particular vessel, this whole chain essentially will fall and then will start undergoing back and forth motion. So, the same way if you actually lower these chains of polymers into a particular vessel by way of uh, changing the temperature, time, uh, uh, viscosity and various other uh, parameters, then they actually are likely to undergo such back and forth folding, uh, back and forth chain folding motion. And as a result, they can create for example, a two dimensional object wherein we may discover certain amount of periodicity occurring by coincidence because this is a long chain this is a long chain, this is another long chain, but we happen to discover as if some of these molecules or these Mars are getting repeated at some regular intervals. And if we trace more carefully, we might even discover that there is a skeleton, there is a skeleton cell which is as if repeated in a given direction. So, starting from a long chain, a long chain if we allow it to undergo back and forth motion, folding motion, then we may discover that as we fold certain regions across the fold appear very similar and very similar because they are, they are made up of the Mars of same composition and they are being repeated at exactly the same distances. So, in case of a normal crystallite, you would expect one atom or one ion or one molecule to come and arrange themselves at regular intervals. And this when repeated in three dimension, we say this is a crystal. And here what we are saying is that these chains, they can arrange themselves such a way that a part of them actually can um, create an imaginary uh, skeletal structure which resembles a particular unit cell. And this unit cell definitely will belong to one of the 14 Bravo lattices 
and that is how we can connect even a polymer or a part of a polymeric solid uh, as crystallite. So, typically this kind of a, a chain folding motion can start from this point and let us say go along this direction, can go along this direction, can go in all possible direction and eventually if this chain folding motion goes in all possible direction, eventually you can end up making a complete sphere because they are allowed to grow randomly in all possible directions. And if you have created such a sphere and now if you take a section out of this sphere, the section will show you something like this, where the chain folding motion allows you to see a periodicity in this pocket, periodicity in this pocket in this pocket, but in between lack of periodicity in this regions. So, this is a cartoon whereas, this is a real time picture of such a chain folded polymeric crystallite formed wherein you can clearly see that maybe this was one particular uh, region where the uh, chain folding started and this is how one particular um, uh, uh, lamellae formed like this, this is how another lamellae formed, this is how another lamellae formed. So, essentially these are different chains radiating in different directions. So, this is a crystallite region, this is a crystallite region, this is a crystallite region and so on and so forth. But in between we also have dark regions and these dark regions are non-crystalline regions. So, if you compare this with a metal, typically in a metal or a, complete or a ceramic uh, crystalline ceramic, you will find 99 percent of the entire region of the bulk as crystal. So, these are all crystals and we call them grains or crystallites. Only a 1 or 2 percent of the area will be boundaries, we call grain boundaries or phase boundaries. These are non-crystalline regions, whereas in a polymeric crystal at best you can have something like about 70, 80, maybe 90 percent at the most which are crystalline, but in between regions will be non-crystalline the so called boundary regions are much more here. That is simply because the each of these chains also have certain amount of rigidity associated with themselves. So, it is not always possible to make 100 percent crystal out of such uh, threads or chains and behave make them behave uh, so periodically that the entire volume can be called a crystallite. So, this is how we can actually crystallize a polymer and when we can do that the advantage is that now when you have such a crystallite, the, the deformation when you try to deform instead of having instead of showing a long, um, uh, so this is again stress strain, instead of showing a fairly low strength, but a long plasticity plastic region. Uh, now, a partially crystallized polymer can actually show you slightly higher or even uh, greater uh, strength mechanical strength. And this is not only possible in the bulk, it can be done even onto the surface. So, now we should try and uh, come to um, we should try to summarize um, what all we have uh, discussed so far. So, compared to metals, first thing we must understand is that uh, solids made up of polymers or polymeric solids will be primarily non-crystalline. So, the strengthening mechanisms are going to be very different and yet we can make them stronger by bringing in certain transformations or change in the structure. One possibility as we saw was crystallization, partial crystallization. We also saw that other non-crystalline stuff which are not polymeric, but partially ionic, predominantly ionic like uh, silicate glass can be made tougher either by partial devitrification or crystallization or by glass tempering whereby we actually can bring in residual compressive stress onto the surface. The question is that when we have composites, when we have dissimilar combinations of metal with ceramic or ceramic with polymer or metal in polymer and so on, the biggest difficulty arises at the interface because they do not talk to each other, they do not tend to talk to each other because the bonding characteristics are different. But if we want a composite for 
particular applications made up of two or more number of uh, materials of different origin like I said uh, metal in polymer or ceramic in polymer, then we must find a way to modify the surface so that these two dissimilar materials can bond well with each other and they do not undergo decohesion at the interface. So, we need to understand the mechanisms which actually allows us such kind of bonding to form and hence we need to understand strengthening mechanisms of the bulk and extend it to the surface. So, uh, so this is all we discussed and uh, in, in the next uh, lecture we would like to take up the strengthening possibilities in steel because uh, you all know that steel continues to be the second largest tonnage wise use material for any kind of structural applications and there are multiple uh, possibilities of application of steel for various uh, purposes. So, uh, we, we uh, will take it up in the next lecture. Thank you very much.